Pardon? I guarantee I'll be messing up your Oh, well, you time. know, it, it's, it's not rocket science. Twenty-nine thirty. Yeah. Um, here, I can help with that. We're a minute away from the countdown. Okay. All right. So we've got this on right now. We're live. We're live. Okay. And, and we're so about to do the countdown. So at the end, and uh, okay, remember when you get to the present, you got slides. You got this way, and present slides. Why can't you story? You already got that one up there. Yeah. Okay. So when I when I ask you can present that one, I'm going to take this in the other room so I okay. can see right. what's going on. Yeah. And you guys have fun. All right. Well, already. We're live. Hey. Welcome to the Joe Tippins live Q&A session. I'm Josh Bellew. I'm going to be fielding some of these questions and handing them to Joe, so hopefully we can be very efficient this morning. Joe has invited myself and Adam Payne, the CEO of Ultra Botanica, on as guests. We are also being joined today by Dr. Deanna Wyndham and Keith Bishop. Keith Bishop is a Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy, retired clinical nutritionist, has a website called Prevail Over Cancer. Please write that down. There's a whole host of great information there. Of course, many of you know Dr. Deanna Wyndham as well of wholehumanlife.com, and they are joining us today to field some of the questions that uh, are not in our wheelhouse. And uh, gosh, Joe, thanks for doing this once again for people. We've got a lot of questions to cover today, my friend. You're welcome. All right. Well, let's get right to it then. You know, a lot of you are Jane McClellan fans out there. Jane McClellan actually wrote in and asked Joe, and many of you have asked the same question, why have you eliminated uh, the tocotrinols, vitamin E, from your protocol, Joe? Well, um, it started out that I thought it was very important, and I think it still is. The problem was is that there's uh, several reasons why you shouldn't be taking vitamin E. That's, for example, if you're on blood thinners. And it became too complex for me to answer and all the questions with tens of thousands out there. So I just eliminated it. But Jane highly recommends it. Okay. And if Jane recommends it, I'm... I'm, I'm in favor of it, so p please feel free to add it. But maybe one of the uh, doctors can tell me what, what are the situations why you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah, is there any comments from uh, Dr. Wyndham or Keith Bishop on the on the why you shouldn't be doing tocotrinols along with the uh, Joe Tippins protocol? Um, I'll chime in. Okay. Hey, can you can hear me? Keith? Okay. Yeah, we okay. can hear you. This is Keith okay, Bishop. Good. Okay. So there's a potential, you know, during chemotherapy radiation or even using supplements at a high dose to affect cells, that the antioxidants from some supplements may actually repair some of the damage that's being done. So the purpose of chemotherapy, radiation, high dose supplements is somewhat to damage those cells and then our immune system to recognize that, attach to it and get rid of that cell. An antioxidant may normalize that cell. 
Yeah, makes makes sense. Uh, uh, Dr. Wyndham, any comments there? Or should we move to the next question? Same. It can. Okay. It, uh, you don't want to use vitamin E in some types of chemotherapy. That's an important time to be working with an integrative or functional medicine practitioner. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. Um, this one is for you, Adam. Uh, could you go over the pathway? And this comes from Jason. Uh, could you go over pathway four and does it need to be taken with pathway one, two, and three? Um, so pathway four is a new addition to the family based upon some um, research that we did in trying to understand the different cellular pathways that were being addressed in pathways one, two, and three. And it turns out there were some fundamental ones that were not addressed. Uh, maybe, uh, guys, can you show those slides that I have there on uh, pathway four? It should be down on the bottom. I think it's over here. Let me make sure that's off. There we go, add the stream. There we go, pathway four. Um, and it's essentially pathway four includes uh, four new ingredients, three of which use our liquid protein scaffold technology to enable their absorption. So some of you might be taking uh, these supplements and uh, obviously you should discuss them with uh, a naturopath or a functional doctor if you have the ability to do so. Um, these ingredients are typically don't absorb well into the body. A lot of you know about EGCG. It's a very powerful uh, green tea extract. There's also resveratrol, which originally was um, discussed as it's uh, coming out of, I think, uh, red grape skins <coughs> uh, for its ability to uh, modulate different, uh, different pathways. And fisetin, which probably very few people know about, is a flavanol, also a polyphenol, that has some very powerful activity on different pathways. I think we can go to the next slide there. How do I do that? And you guys know how to go to the next slide? <laughs> I think there's a button swiping down help. there. Oh, that would be nice if it's swiping did help. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Move from stream. Let's go to add to stream. And it's guys, can you figure out how to get to the next slide? No. Oh, well. there, there should be a way to click to the next slide. Um, and it is not there. All right. So differentially, I can probably. I don't know why it's not working. Uh, full screen layout, and then there we go, pathway four. So it's different, uh, it, it affects three different um, aspects of cell cellular health that the other pathways don't address. One is the mTOR pathway, and mTOR pathways is a unique ability to uh, influence cancer progression and cell growth and proliferation. And that is, that's addressed in the other ones, but mTOR is uniquely affected by pathway four. And in some cancers, uh, mTOR is uh, uh, way out of control. And it's the reason why s different kinds of tumors actually have out of control growth. Uh, pathway four also uniquely addresses uh, P53 differentially than um, uh, pathway 2 does. There is some synergy there. Curcumin is a powerful activator of P53. Both fisetin and EGCG also influence P53, and a lot of people know about P53. And pathway 4 uniquely addresses a cellular pathway called VEGF. And VEGF is uh, what is responsible for um, uh, blood supply that is grown into the tumors, where VEGF is out of control, it's actually helping the tumors to uh, produce a lot more blood supply to the, to the cancers. Let's go to the last uh, slide there, if you guys figured it out. There we go. So you can see the supplement facts panel. Uh, pathway 4 synergistically affects AMPK, and a lot of you know what that is. That's what, oh, we lost it. That's okay. Uh, differentially affects AMPK. Um, it, dif it also um, synergizes with pathway 2 on inflammation pathways like NF-kappa-beta, COX-2, 5 LOX. And it also synergizes very strongly with the NRF2 pathway, which is responsible for cellular detoxification. So there's a lot of reasons why pathway 4 could be a great addition. Um, Joe, we don't, you just learned about pathway 4. Yeah, so. I'm new to it as well. Um, I would maybe chime in with Dr. Wyndham and uh, Keith, what you guys think about it, whether this has a... Yeah, I, 
I'd love to talk about it. The um, I just learned about Pathway 4 recently in the last month, and I've been using it. Um, up until we had Pathway 4, I was trying to address these sorts of things like the angiogenesis, the NRF2, um, hitting the mTOR harder. So I love this product. I've been adding it in to everybody. Okay. I can't think of a place I haven't used it yet in relation to cancer. Interesting. Great. Uh, Keith, any thoughts? Yes, I've been using these products for years uh, in a, uh, a combination of these products. has been you know, several different bottles a couple times a day. Uh, I've been taking these for many years. You're talking about EGCG and resveratrol individually? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about I, Fisetin? I'm just curious. I admit, that's a new one for me. Yeah, no, it's a really powerful uh, flavanol, polyphenol. Again, it's, uh, it's had the uh, horrible history of not being able to absorb into the body. Our liquid protein scaffolding technology was, we were able to use it on all three of these ingredients, allowing them to be uh, absorbed at levels that probably have not, never been achieved before. All right, so let's, um, I think that, did that answer? Pat yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay, yes. great. Yeah, Thanks, let's, everybody. I think that. this next one for Joe, Diana, and, uh, or Deanna, and, uh, and uh, Keith should be a really quick answer. Is using the protocol without a diagnosis a good approach to prevention? Joe? I believe so. Okay. Um, I, I recommend my own family take it uh, as a preventative or prophylactic. And uh, one of the primary reasons I do is because of the uh, proven science that fenbendazole uh, spikes production of new healthy wild type P53. And, uh, and if you, there's no better preventative than making sure your body has the right level of P53, which is the cancer killing gene going through your body 24 seven, uh, preventing metastasis. Very nice. And so yeah, if you can activate P53, it actually causes cell death. Yeah, so we all have cancer floating through our bodies 24 seven, right? But, it, but we all, the healthy people here have a, a healthy level of P53 that's uh, preventing metastasis and keeping, them, keeping it at bay. Um, I uh, am a firm believer in that. And um, it was the scientist in India that, that proved that finbendazole was doing that. And I think, didn't Dr. Benbrook also, I don't know if she actually uh, corroborated that, but it's a really important pathway. All right. She let's, did. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, Joe, someone writes, uh, bless you for sharing your story and your efforts with anyone helping to face the challenge. Um, two questions. What is your opinion for supplements to protect the liver, milk thistle versus Tutka? And then question two, and I believe it got cut off, but I think it was going to be what's the most cost effective way to be able to purchase fenbendazole. So uh, I know that uh, you'll have a, something to say, and Keith and Deanna may as well. Well, <clears throat> Look, f first of all, uh, there's quite a few uh, charlatan products that have come off, uh, come online, mostly because of me uh, selling different forms of fenbendazole. I highly recommend you don't buy from those people because I believe their products are not made in a good GMP manufacturing facility. They're either from China or Eastern Europe. and um, Several times they've been tested to not be at the purity levels that they that they uh, advertise. I recommend only Merck products, either either um, Safeguard or Panicure C. Interesting, and yeah. that and that's because the Merck is essentially running everything at a pharmaceutical level. Yes, and so even though it says for animals, it's we know that it's produced in an environment that they test yes. for the potency. Yeah, right. Well, well, that led right into another one, Joe, and that is, is there a reputable place to purchase uh, fenbendazole in bulk? Uh, is there any specific place you know of that is a safe haven to, to get it? Yes, that both Panacure and Safeguard are available in bulk tubs. Um, okay. You just, and everybody asks me, where do you buy it? Well, I Google it every time because prices are variable. And um, it seems time, every time I Google where the right sources are, the cheapest place is somewhere else. So it's, it's pretty easy to, to, uh, to find um, just by Googling. All right, so I, I dealt with my own cancer issue. I, you know, some of you know I, I had a diagnosis of melanoma a couple months ago. I was able to find it on Amazon very inexpensively. Yeah. 
Very good. Okay, we've got a. Uh, this one may we may head into. Have a quick addition here, if I could. Please. Sure. There's a liquid form of Safeguard um, that I believe is made by Merck, and it's on Amazon. And taking that liquid form, I believe, is less expensive. It's 2.25 milliliters. Can anybody speak to whether well, or not that's a valid form? Or uh, a it's very valid, but I don't think it's cheaper when you do the dosage. It's because it's, uh, you know, 100 milligrams per milliliter. Um, of finbendazole, and you really need to take 250 milligrams of finbendazole. So it's, you know, t two and a half to three mils uh, for each dose. But yeah, there's a lot of people that can't can't take the the dry powder, and so they do the liquid form. Okay, Interesting. Very good. Okay. Um, so does anyone actually know? Because I've not even heard of Tudka. T U D C A. Uh, is it better than milk thistle? And again, this kind of leans back into liver health uh, while someone may be undergoing uh, chemotherapy and other things. Yeah, well, I, I didn't answer your first question it's about okay. liver health. Okay. Um, yeah, I recommend milk thistle if, uh, if the fenbendazole is causing a spike in your liver enzymes. Um, so uh, as a preventative measure for the liver, take milk thistle along with the, the protocol. Keith, Deanna? So, I'll go uh, speak a little bit about that. And so, you know, kind of like a, a little bit newer type item. And have to admit, I'm not an expert on that yet. Uh, I've had a lot of questions on it, and and there's not as much research on it. Uh, where we go to milk thistle, the active ingredients in that have a ton of research for not only supporting the liver, repairing the liver, but also. Um, anti-cancer benefits uh, just every single time I've ever looked up a cancer you know there's some support in and and typically cancer cell studies showing that it helps out and helps kill those cancer cells so there's a couple of reasons I prefer that at this time till we learn more very good and okay I would Go also ahead. like to add that um, you know, there's there were also some questions about finbendazole, 50 milligram per kilogram dosage versus 222. I'd like to clarify that a little bit in relation to liver health. So the finbendazole, if you were going to use it as a parasite treatment, you would use it at 50 milligrams per kilogram, which would be for an average person of 170 pounds, about 3,500 milligrams a day. So using it at 222 or I've noticed people mention even dosages up to 888 milligrams a day, which we're not talking about that dosing right now, but using it even up to that dosing is really not maxing out how much the liver is able to deal with that dosage. Yeah, so see, it's a really safe dosage to take. Yeah, well, actually, in, in addition to that, uh, Johns Hopkins has actually done a toxicity trial. Mm -hmm and determined that 500 milligrams a day long term is safe. Oh. Do any people, do, do you, anybody have any ideas why some people see elevated liver enzymes during the use of uh, fenbendazole? Uh, no, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I originally, the, the other question is I've seen multiple times is how come I went from three days a week to seven days a week? And I started at three days a week seven years ago because I heard there was research that said Finbin could uh, negatively affect the liver. However, after the Johns Hopkins, reading the Johns Hopkins toxicity trial, and with tens of thousands of people all over the world experimenting with dosages, um, I came to the conclusion that seven days a week was safe. And the only reason I started at three days a week is because I didn't think it was safe. And lo and behold, the research that said it was unsafe, I, I dug it up and found out that they it was based on dosage a thousand times what we're talking about oh, here. Oh, wow. Well, if you're doing a thousand times anything, you're going to cause problems, I think. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. A kilogram of sugar. I think we have a caller. Rick? Yes, we do. And caller, you're on the well, air. You're doing a thousand times. Hello. Hello. Coke, are you there? We may have lost them. They can call back in. We'll move on here. Um, so, is there any evidence for fenbendazole related to skin cancers? Oh, yeah. Um, 
quite a few success cases with taking <coughs> the safeguard or panicure form in paste form, which is made for goats, and literally directly ap applying it uh, topically successfully, as well as uh, several cases of uh, where it's already metastasized from the skin uh, into the bloodstream and with successes there as well. Great. This is a, a little bit of an incomplete question, but we're going to go ahead and try to take this. And, and this probably will apply to you, Joe, as well as Dan and Keith. Uh, this individual says they started taking Fenban three days on, four off for a couple of weeks, then moved to taking it five days, was also taking turkey tail, uh, THC, berberine, quercetin, curcumin, D3K2 fish oil. They said they've always had perfect liver enzymes until about a month into the protocol. I have no idea. It's above my pay grade. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, Deanna, Keith? Yeah, there are other things that I would look at. So if this person has cancer, there might be some cancer cell die-off that's impacting the liver. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, um, that's, yep, that's that interesting. The, yeah. Yeah. And also remember that the cancer is a major detox organ, and there are two um, major detoxification pathways through the liver. So you might be detoxing parasites, there might be other things that you're detoxing, but I don't think that the finbendazole dosage itself, based on research, is, I don't think that that's what's causing the elevation of liver enzymes. Although, obviously, I'm not your doctor and couldn't say for certain. Um, that would be my, my first go-to answer. Great contribution there. Um, Keith, do you want to weigh in on that at all? And we're going to be needing to move a little bit quicker here down this road. So the, there's a possibility that, you know, almost every herb, you know, is going to be metabolized by the liver. And so, and everybody is different. They have different abilities to detox, different SNPs that allow, don't allow that to happen. And, you know, there may be a person that if you have three or four or more herbs along with other drugs, you know, there might be an issue. And that's where you have to evaluate that and maybe decrease doses. The herbs are more like a, a drug and they are metabolized through the liver also. You know, this is a question I'd love the, um, our, uh, the, the people on Facebook to maybe answer for us. Um, for the people that had experienced elevated liver enzymes, after uh, some time, did they go back to normal? Have you had any indications of, of long-term liver issues? Or was this just a, something that, that happened temporarily? If you don't mind chiming in on the question, for those of you that have had that, experienced that, we would love to hear your response, and maybe we can address this separately, okay. just as a, an interesting topic. My, my feeling is, and this is just my feeling and my, my opinion, is that it's just a transitory effect, and it's not going to have any long-term impact mm -hmm. on health. I mean, if you're dealing with cancer, you probably elevated liver enzymes are not the worst thing that can be happening. Well, well look, and we also have... Uh, I don't know the denominator, but we have a uh, hundred thousand people globally taking this, and very few report uh, liver issues. And we're seeing some people chime in on the chat here, mm -hmm. saying that they've had no liver issues. Some people have, some people taking Tudka for it, etc. Yeah. For those of you wondering, the uh, broadcast will be available. There will be a link, just like all the other live Q and As that Joe has hosted, that will be posted on mycancerstory.rocks. So. Feel free to share that out to friends and loved ones. I think it can be uh, a very powerful uh, help for them and their education. So, uh, Adam and Joe, I think, uh, Onco was okay with Fenben until uh, doctor recommended chemo for liver metastases. And then in quotations, they say, interferes with chemo efficacy of GEM, CIS, DERVA, are there certain chemo that chemically react with Fenben explaining why some achieve remission and others continue to progress? Wow. I don't think there's anything contradictory on uh, Fenben uh, to chemo. Now, okay. Onco 2, you should not take while you're on chemo. Right, because the curcumin can, in some circumstances, can, can interfere with the toxicity of the, uh, of the chemotherapies. There are some chemotherapies that are synergized with, um, with uh, curcumin, and those really are questions that should be lined up to, um, uh, for, uh, for the doctors. I see a question here about uh, 
Finn Bendizel being weight dependent for dogs, why is it not weight dependent for for humans? That's a, it's a pretty simple question. Look, for dogs, it's a three-day regimen, and it kills parasites. This is seven days a week, long term, and it's got a completely different pathway by which it's affecting cancer than by which way it's affecting parasites. Don't get confused with parasites causing cancer. That, that's a whole different path. that's a whole different rabbit hole. We don't need to go down. What we do know scientifically is that Finbin has three pathways by which it's killing cancer. It has nothing to do with parasites. Very good. Thanks. Yeah, there, there, just to jump in, there's uh, been a really interesting article that ha that uh, directly relates c solid tumors to different fungal infections, um, which is an entirely separate topic. Uh, but there's really s some really interesting research that's been going on out there about how what is what is going on at the cellular level, and it's in the cell cancer cells interactions with its environment and with the with the body. Yeah. Okay. Um, I believe they mean OMRF, or Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, on this guy, so I'm going to read it that. It says, earlier we were told that OMRF, Emory, and Stanford had been auditing fenbendazole results, and I reported my journey with OMRF and discussed it with them. Have any of those institutions released any more conclusions from their auditing? Uh, no, other than uh, Washington and Stanford did actually publish uh, a paper on the results of their audit. And, and, and it was positive, yes. And, and, and it was very limited, am I correct, Joe? Yeah. There wasn't a lot of data there? Yeah, they, they, you know, they couldn't uh, go through dozens and dozens of cases. So they just handpicked a handful of cases out and then published a paper on that. And interesting, I think two of those uh, handful uh, were taking only the protocol and nothing else. Interesting. Uh, so we have a question here, does the protocol work on dogs with cancer? Yeah, in fact, in the Facebook group, if you look at the top, there is a uh, separate group of people. It's just sec uh, solely for pets, and lots of people posting success stories out there for pets. Yeah, there's no placebo effect in a pet, right? Yeah, we don't know. <laughs> they, they can't tell us. They can't tell us, right, <laughs> and they don't know what they're getting. <laughs> All right, let's... Uh, Josh, you have a question there? Yeah, this is for Joe again. The, the, uh, uh, Joyce asks, is there any progress at the moment of medical doctors accepting the fenbendazole products? And, of course, we've got Dr. Deanna Wendham on the, on the call as well. It has stopped my cancer growth. I know the big pharmaceuticals don't want it, but it has proven it's an incomplete question. But, obviously, yeah, they've had could, a great experience. We could have a whole separate podcast about that. Uh, Look, it's not human approved, so it's illegal for a doctor to prescribe it, okay? Um, when I started this journey seven years ago, 90% uh, of all doctors and particularly oncologists told everybody I was a quack and don't listen to me. Today, I believe 65 to 70% of oncologists will go winky winky, go ahead and try it, it's not going to hurt you. Okay. Uh, and you know what? R rule number one of medicine is don't make it worse. Right. And we have hundreds of thousands of people out there with proof that it, 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 the downside is virtually zero. Um, and, and we now have over a, a thousand success cases documented, so we know there's upside. And in anything in life, if there's zero downside and plenty of upside, the only question you ought to ask is why not? You know, there's um, the... The, the technical rules for physicians, and Deanna and, and Keith, you might want to jump in on this, is you can use anything off-label. And I don't know if, and it, it seems to me that off-label use, even if it's designed for an animal, is still within the, rain, the realm of something that could be prescribed for a human. I, I would love to, I'm, I'm sure yeah. that would have to be tested up to the Supreme Court. The only, the only way that'll work is under the uh, do, uh, uh, emergency use. No, the uh, the compassionate uh, oh, care, compassionate com care right, use right. and the right to try legislation. But the FDA is literally stopping anybody trying to use that uh, those, for those, other purposes. Those, lo those legislations. So, uh. you know, I am working on getting a clinical trial done. There's no economic benefit to anybody other than the United States government because of Medicare. Um, no pharmaceutical company is going to spend three to four hundred million dollars for a clinical trial 
only to have generic competition the next day because these drugs are 20 years removed from patent. Yeah, this is, that would be great. This is an important question. Um, Sen writes, I've read that fenbendazole will not work or make things worse if one has the TP53 gene mutation and they should take mebendazole instead. Wondering if you can give any explanation or clarification regarding that. Please. I actually believe I got proof that it's just the opposite of that. Interesting. I believe Finben is the one that is producing new wild type P53 that uh, Meben doesn't. Okay. And, and that's I think the research actually supported by research by at Dor uh, at OU by Doris Benbrook. Benbrook found yes. that. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you for that. Thanks, Tina. Um, I've been taking the current protocol since May 9th of this year. Pathway 1 has been very helpful uh, related to pain issues. I'm feeling great now. I'm wondering, do I go on the maintenance version of Pathway 1? Um, do you have active cancer? That's the question. You know, uh, I, I recommend the, f the full protocol seven days a week for anybody with active cancer. And I believe if you're in remission, you certainly should go back to three days a week as a, as a uh, preventative. Yes. And as a reminder, this is going to be on mycancerstory.rocks. The link will be there after this. I think it'll probably be posted sometime today. Um, let's see. Hi, Joe. Uh, just diagnosed with invasive ductal carcinoma with ER plus started taking Fenben, lion's mane, turkey tail, three apricot kernel CBD. I hear some supplements aren't good to take with my type of cancer. Does anyone know which supplements may not be recommended with this invasive ductal carcinoma with ER? I don't know. I don't. We have success cases with that subtype of cancer with the protocol. I'm not sure. I know other things that should not be taken. I, okay, Keith or De Deanna, anything there? I don't know of any concerns. Okay. No, me either. Very good. Okay, uh, Joe, this is to you. The scientists that cured their brain cancer, and, and I'm not sure I understand this, did they use any product to pass BBB? The blood blame barrier. Thank you, very good. Okay. No, didn't didn't and my mom has small cell with METs to the brain. The brain cancer was minimal, but we decided not to mess around. Did a webinar to try to get it all, or did a WBR to try to get it all. Um, and we, we know, because of the success cases we've had, right. that it crosses the blood-brain barrier. Gotcha, gotcha. And very No, good. and she did not take anything else to get it to cross the blood-brain barrier. Okay, very good. All right. Maybe Let's while see. you're looking for the next question, I could pose one myself because sure. I noticed on um, some of the questions that people wrote in on, and we've kind of skirted the issue a couple times about dosing. So people have used 222 milligrams a day, but they've also used up to 888 milligrams a day or four doses, so two doses twice a day. Is there, um, Joe, have you encountered any research to indicate when patients might use different dosages? Or no, well, different no. so all of the dose? people out there across the world are, are bold and brave, and they've all done their own experiments on higher dosages. Um, I wouldn't recommend, I, I know because of the John, John Hopkins toxicity trial that it's safe at 500. I would be crazy to ad, uh, advise people to go above that. I mean, and I don't think it's necessary. I think uh, going from 222 to 444, no problem uh, if people want to try that. Uh, but it, we have a lot of successes with people just doing 222. And Very good. for the record, my the patients that I have that have cancer, the highest dosage I'm using also is 444. I, I'm not going above that either. Yep. Very good. Uh, Joe, just some positive, encouraging comments. Jermaine and Sandy both say thank you. They tell your story to many people. Uh, hello from Colorado. Uh, so thankful for you. And uh, we'll move on to the next page here. And let's see. Again, Sabrina, thank you, Joe. Um, so, da, da, da. incomplete question. I'm so sorry. Uh, Dee Dee, related to a PET scan, improved by 50%. Um, let's see, another question for you, Joe. Are Panicure and Safeguard by Merck the only two brands you advise to take? We've covered that earlier, but there may be people that have just joined us. Uh, yeah, 
and I and for only one reason, uh, it's pharmaceutical grade quality control in a CGMP uh, FDA approved manufacturing facility by a major company that is making drugs every day for people, and all the other sources uh, can't claim that and. Maybe they, you know, that's possible. There's some products out there that are decent, um, but why would you want to take something other than from uh, a reputable major uh, pharmaceutical company that's uh, manufacturing in a in the right way? Yeah, great answer, um, Gwen, Sabrina, Robert, Brenda. Just all give you a big high five and a hello, Joe. They appreciate you. Um, okay, here we go. Okay, now, so Joe just answered this question. Uh, he doesn't recommend anything other than the Panicure or Safeguard, so that was uh, just reemphasized once again. Um, he does mention something. He says, I found a Cooper's Panicure 100 liquid made by MSD. Is that Merck? No. Would it be okay? It's not Merck, okay? It's not Merck. Very good, okay. Final question, have people with mesothelioma peritoneal responded to fenbendazole? Have they had to increase the amount? How quickly are they seeing results? You know, that's one I do not know the answer to. Um, uh, I wish I did. Uh, there's probably somebody out there that could uh, chime in and tell me that they've done, done it and it was successful or not, but that's the one subtype. Uh, that I do not know. And about. Joe, they do actually reference that some lady did post on uh, your, okay. your, your deal that when they went to 888 milligrams a day, that's when the results began to happen. I, well, I see. Yep. Uh, you know, people, I don't read the Facebook group every day. Right. I've got a full-time job. Uh, I do have great moderators out there uh, that are moderating. So, uh, Lara writes, were you on any steroids, Joe, when you started to take fenbendazole? No. Okay. No. Very good. Um, so now we have a, an interesting question here that comes in and also mentions ivermectin. And uh, so there may be a few wanting to weigh in on this. What, what are the correct amounts of ivermectin and fenbendazole? We've, Joe's already covered that he's very comfortable with the 222 milligrams a day in the yeah. Panicure C packets and the safe I, card, right? I believe, uh, th this is my own personal opinion. It's not based on anything other than I can't find credible science that says ivermectin is effective for cancer. It's great for COVID. Uh, I'm not sure about cancer. And I, I, you, people want to take it. That's fine. I just, I'd love for somebody to send me research where ivermectin is, is, is effective for cancer. Deanna or Keith, do you have any comments about that? By office. Yeah, actually, I will send you some uh, research, Joe. There has been some um, limited research of using ivermectin in cancer um, with some um, some good results there. Um, this I'm looking at a research from 2023, from March of this year, actually, and I'll send that out to you. Yeah, but, I'd like to see it. Um, yeah, but there I could not find anything on combining the two, but there is some limited research on ivermectin in cancer. That's great. Good to know. Interesting. Um, and uh, another question quickly, Joe, um, do you have people that have mentioned that they have gone into remission or no evidence of disease with prostate cancer? Oh, my oh gosh. probably the number one success out there. Dozens and dozens and dozens of successful prostate cases. Right. I just got another one emailed to me yesterday. A uh, guy had a PSA of 1100 and after six weeks on the protocol, it was 0 0.5, 0 0.5, from 1100 to below one. Um, How long was that difference? Over six weeks. Six weeks? Yeah. That's incredible. Uh, Deanna, I think specifically you referenced that you might want to weigh in on this particular next question, and I, it, it was so long, but I've kind of nailed it down to things. Uh, people with high level of allergies have lower incidence of cancer, truth or not. Uh, people with allergies have higher level of histamine. People with allergies may have acute histamine in response to parasites. Histamine tends to destroy or impede parasites. And then they go on to say uh, their conclusion, does fenbendazole elevate histamine level or destroy parasites? A higher level of histamine destroys cancer. 
the immune system can focus on cancer after parasites die off. I know there's a lot of moving pieces there, but I know you have some thoughts there, Deanna. Well, and Jim. I'm, I, I do believe there is some connection to some cancers and parasites, but that's not why I'm recommending fen fenbendazole. I'm not, it's not to kill the parasites. We know the three pathways by the cell structure, the microtubules, uh, the inability to metabolize sugar, and the increase in P53 is the real reason why fenbendazole works, which really has n nothing to do with parasites. Okay. Any other right. comments before we move on? We have and a question. In, Go ahead, Deanna. In regards Go ahead, Deanna. to the in regards to the histamine and cancer, um, that's actually super complicated, but histamine, there are four different types of histamine receptors, and there's a lot of research indicating that histamine does play a part in cancer development and progression. So a lot of the research with histamine and cancer is in antihistamines and how that Im uh, positively impacts cancer. And so, there is some mixed research. Histamine may potentially help with cancer and histamine production may hurt cancer. But most of the therapies, especially with immunotherapy, they're working a lot with antihistamines in cancer. Um, and then related to that, somebody had a question about NETs, neutrophil, extracellular um, traps, and that also may work through the histamine response, not uh, indirectly. So just to kind of throw that out there, um, it's it's a mixed bag picture yeah, to answer okay. the question about his Here's, thanks, here's thanks a question. Me. It says, uh, Jim has recurrent melanoma on the forehead treated with radiation and excision. Considering Keytruda and wants to start finbendazole, he's refusing Keytruda. I think he should be doing Keytruda because we know from all the cases out there that uh, the, the protocol works well in conjunction with the immunotherapy drugs. And, and I, you know, and I would recommend getting with a good functional doctor that can help guide all of these different things that, uh, sit, that could synergize with what the oncologist is doing. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, my, my general take on, on the, all of this is I tell people it's cancer and it's going to kill you. So why not throw everything but the kitchen sink at it? And I recommend people take this protocol concurrently with and parallel to anything and everything the traditional doctors want to throw at it, unless in the case of pathway two, you're on chemo or, in a, or if, if you have on blood thinners, you shouldn't be doing vitamin E, stuff right. like that. Yep. I'm going to rephrase Debbie's question a little bit because you've addressed it already, Joe, but I, I think maybe it'll give more clarification. She's, she's inquiring about taking Finben prophylactically, and my, que my question to you, Joe, is I believe I've heard you say that it would be your intention to take it yourself the rest of your life. I'm going to take it three days a week the rest of my three life. Three days a week the rest of your life. Yeah. Okay. And so would you say that would be a, a prophylactic? That that would be the Joe Tippins recommendation. Yeah, it, okay. I think if you look at the protocol tab, it says that you know if you're never had cancer before and you want to try it as a prophylactic, or your long-term remission, I recommend staying on it three days a week. Okay. Hey, there's a question uh, from John on the uh, on the stream. Deanna and Keith, how how do I find a functional doctor? I am so glad he asked that. <laughs> I've been dying to say. So there are a couple resource sites to find uh, functional medicine doctors, uh, a4m.com, that's the letter A, the number four, the letter M, dot org, sorry, not dot com, dot org. You want mm -hmm. to look for a doctor specifically who specializes in cancer. And then you can also go specifically for cancer referral to peopleagainstcancer.com. What was that People again? Against cancer. People against People cancer. People against cancer. Com. Okay. And there's cancer control society. Com. Cancer control society. Com. Both of all three of those sites uh, will be able to give you referrals to doctors who specifically treat cancer. For A4M, it's not specific to cancer, so you have to say that in your when you're doing the referral. That's just on their website. For the other two, they specialize in cancer referrals. You know, Adam, I think we should update the blog 
to say what she just said with links to those sites. Yeah, yeah there's another, there's one more site, ifm.org, for functional medicine, and they also have a, a, a finder there. It's ifm.org where you can look for functional doctors that have specific cross-training in oncology. Keith, what about for the clinical nutritionists out there? How do people find somebody that they can get on their team with, uh, with your credentials? Uh, uh, that would be a challenge. So it'd be more of a you know internet search. Um, but what I recommend actually is well actually most of them don't have the same type of experience I do because I've been doing this for so long. But check with a compounding pharmacy also. So if you're having a hard time finding somebody, compounding pharmacy they know the doctors that like to do you know functional integrative uh, alternative type things that are willing to step outside the box. And they may be able to guide you to a, a local practitioner where you live. That's great information. Thank you all for that. So why does Onco Adjunct work so well with Panicure? And it's a two-part question. And then can an individual who has cancer stage four but has refused to take Panicure benefit from using Onco Adjunct Pathways? Well, that's a question for Adam. I wouldn't recommend it, but uh, there may be some benefits there. Well, I'm sorry, the question being... So, so the initial question, Adam, was um, why does Onco Adjunct Pathway System work so well with Panicure? And then the second portion of that question was if an individual is refusing to take Panicure, can they still benefit from using the Onco Adjunct Pathway System? So um, the Pathway System was designed actually with Joe's input based upon uh, compounds that you were taking mm -hmm. when, you were, um, when you were supplementing your approach to cancer and that was based upon your research. That was curcumin and um, uh, and what were the other ones that you're CBD, right? CBD, yeah. yeah, the hemp extracts, et cetera. And, and the care oncology added, uh, b uh, you know, met metformin. Yeah, the berberin, that's right. And the berberin is a replacement for the metformin. So, yeah, everything in my protocol, I'm not a scientist or a doctor, but I'm a voracious researcher. And that's I did true. A, probably two man years of research. And that's how I came up with them. The problem I had was uh, blood ab uh, absorption into the bloodstream. And the, the reason I'm here sitting with these guys is they figured out how to make stuff that's not absorbable, absorbable. Yeah, so our, our primary research came out of the University of Oklahoma, not to toot our home too much. And we were focusing on curcumin for a decade and, and working with researchers there to figure out ways to get it in the body. Our LPS patented technology is um, a f it's a platform that actually works with a whole slew of ingredients that are very difficult to absorb. Quercetin, um, curcumin, uh, EGCG, fisetin, resveratrol. resveratrol. All of these ingredients have an absorption of less than 2% into the body. So the ability of uh, LPS technology just makes them get into the body at a very high rate. And, uh, and people can experience benefits from it. So we're grateful, Joe, that you recommend our products. We're, we're here to help facilitate a dialogue between um, uh, people that are using your, or want to use your technology and your product. So, so I guess the answer to your question is, yeah, there's going to be some benefit. I, I believe Finn ben, I, I believe uh, curcumin is a wonder drug. And once you can get it into your bloodstream at the right level, it's going to have a positive effect. Yeah. I just think it works so well in conjunction with the Finn ben for different reasons. Yeah. Doc, uh, what do you guys think about it? I, yeah, I, I would like to say that I tell my patients that your products are four to ten times or more absorbable than the next best product behind it. And I stopped using all other products when I found out about your products. Um, and that's not just because I'm here. That's because that's that's the truth. And so um, I do definitely believe that these could be used as standalone products. They don't have to be used with Panicure, but I do recommend for all patients to address all the aspects of cancer. And I don't know how you do it, Joe, like if you have a, a particular diet, but there are metabolic aspects of cancer, there are aspects of cancer that have to do with the microbiome, with nutritional deficiencies, with environmental toxins, with chronic infections of all types, not just parasites. and sleep and stress and many other factors that impact um, cancer. So the the supplements can be standalone therapy. They can be used with finbendazole. They are excellent products by any uh, measure. 
but also addressing other factors of cancer, especially if patients don't want to take finbendazole, which I have seen myself in people. Which once again would lead people to, when we post those links, if you need to find a functional and integrative approach to uh, your cancer, then those links will be posted at mycancerstory.rocks so that you can do your own search in your own neighborhood, your own community, and find. Uh, Joe, Dina or Dinah writes, uh, evidently she's really struggling, and she says, did you start feeling worse before getting better when you started your protocol? Uh, the truth is, I didn't feel anything. Uh, and I didn't know in that uh, three-month period between PET scans from being lit up like a Christmas tree to being dark, I didn't know what was happening inside my body. I didn't have any symptoms. I, didn't, I felt fine, uh, which was, was strange to me because I was told I only had three months to live and two months of it I was feeling Great. perfectly fine. <laughs> right? So the, the sad news is I don't know when in that three-month journey it took effect because uh, I went from lit up like a Christmas tree to dark in a three month period. And you didn't feel any bad and between. I didn't right. feel any different. So, uh, so Deanna and Keith, do you ever note that when you're moving someone into a change of protocol diet, things like that, um, and you're implementing that, do you oftentimes see them feeling worse before they start feeling better? I definitely can see some issues uh, whenever I'm working with their food program. Um, you know, they may be going hypoglycemic, their body's not used to, uh, you know, getting by without the sugar. You're know, giving right. them things to get the sugars into the cells. And, uh, and so there definitely can be. And so uh, sometimes there needs to be gradual changes in food programs. Um, that I have kind of like certain things I try to say, okay, well, we, this is my number one thing from what you're doing based off of what you're eating. This is the main thing you need to stop. Um, but it, it can be a challenge. You know, uh, sometimes side effects more due to what they're eating uh, is more common than, than the supplement or, or medication things uh, that I've seen thus far. Okay, interesting. We have a caller, so let's uh, get him on the line here. Do we, who do we have, Rick? Uh, Hello? Hello? Yep. Hello, hey. on there. Yep, good, good morning. So what's going on? We have a caller. So if you could turn off your uh, or turn down your background I noise, Depp, thank you I so much. Yep, your uh, what's your name and what's your question? Um, Edward Thomas. Uh, it's kind of a long question because I want to give you just like a brief thirty-second history. Um, you want me just? Jeff, go for it, please. Basically, mom had a bilateral mastectomy. Um, three years later, started having back pains. I gave her ivermectin. She was on. She went to a walker actually. I remember a month later off the walker, off the cane, everything. Met a friend that the, 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 doing the uh, Joe Tippins protocol at the marina. She started us on to that. Then my mom continued on that path. Along with it, we went to Carmanos Cancer Institute, and she was taking Ibrantz, Exgiva, and Letrozole, and that's been about what seven, eight months now. Yeah. The eye brands was giving her a hard time, a little hard time breathing. All the numbers were going down, those tumor markers. I uh, had to stop taking the, the, the eye brands because of the breathing issue. And now the numbers are heading back north. And I just wondered if we should be increasing possibly the fenbendazole or for the liver. We, had, we also had a PET scan, too, that showed irregularities in the liver. And that's what we're concerned about, not the bones. So and the much. liver enzymes are up. Yeah. And the liver enzymes are up. Can I ask a question here before we dig in? Do you, do you have a good functional doctor or naturopath or clinical nutritionist that you're working with? Uh, we not really. We're working with just Carmanos and uh, the girl Debbie I know who just passed away okay. um, had a good setup, but they had I, I don't know. No, we don't recall. Are you, what part of the country do you live in? Uh, Michigan. Michigan. Maybe this is a question for our doctor on the call, but I've always separated uh, liver metastasis from the primary. somebody, somebody, something causing spike in liver enzymes, because those yeah. are two totally different issues, aren't they? Right. So the you can get 
a spike in liver enzymes from liver metastasis. You can also get a spike in liver enzymes from inflammation or detox. And I have seen people's liver enzymes Hello. spike and also their PET scans look worse due to inflammation from the die-off process. So it, you definitely need the help of an integrative or functional medicine doctor be, to help you weed through those effects and whether those are good or bad signs, whether you should be adding supplements or other medications. Um, so those are things that really you should get help but with. I, I don't think I would increase the dosage of Finbin. Uh, and until you get a little bit more study two or three months down the road on your liver enzymes. Yeah, and, and there are there are multiple things. Are are you taking? Are you guys taking the uh, pathway products, or are you, are you taking something different? Um, right now, are we taking the pathway products? Are you asking me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I hear the background. I got out of the room to hear you. Sure. Um, the pathway products. I don't. Um, I know we're taking the fenbendazole. We're doing uh, some of the. Uh, we're not doing the onco one, two, and three. Is that in the pathway? Product yeah. The, the, yeah. Is, is, I'm just curious. Is there a reason why you're not taking those? Does any of those? Well, I don't know. I thought there was maybe. Um, I, I didn't know if there's an interaction. Number one, I didn't tell my doctor, my mom's doctor, at Carmano's that we um, are on fenbendazole. Yeah. Is she on not chemo? Concerned. Not on chemo. No. I, I recommend Joe? I recommend doing the pathway one, two, and three because they're very conjunctive with the finbin disease. Hang on. And I would also uh, add Joe? pathway four and ultra brock since it's okay, um, breast metastatic breast. And a lot of this sounds like an advertisement for ultra botanica. I want everybody to know I, th I, this is not about money. I'm not making any money off of this. I, I just right. did two man years yeah. of research and found these guys, and I think the products are the right fit for finbendazole. Very good. Hey, thank you, caller. We appreciate that. Um, let's move on to this next one. Um, Adam, uh, pathways one through three, better to take before or after a meal? How far apart should the dosages be? Sure. So, a three -part um, question here. so Keep pathway going. one, we recommend starting in the evening, and it's based upon weight. It's um, it can be a hard pill to swallow. It's not a pill; it's a liquid. It doesn't taste great, <laughs> True. Uh, but it does have all the cannabinoids. It has the frankincense essential oils in it. Pathway two, we recommend in the morning and in the evening, with or without food. It doesn't really matter. Pathway three is the one we recommend taking with a meal. I recommend taking one capsule with a light meal and two capsules with a heavy meal. The, um, we use uh, the whey protein conjugate on the berberin because it's the fastest absorbing uh, scaffold that we have. So when you take it with food, it actually has the opportunity to help affect glucose metabolism directly when you're actually absorbing stuff that has right. glucose you're in gonna it. You're going to get that spike. And pathway four, if you choose to take that one, that's the same dosing time as pathway two, which would be two capsules in the morning and two capsules in the evening. Adam, how do people choose between Pathway 2 and Pathway 2 Pharo? Well, okay, so Pathway 2 Pharo was designed to be complementary with Jane McClellan's protocol, which completely eliminates cysteine out of, the, um, out of the product. So the only difference, you're getting the same amount of curcumin, quercetin, and, and the frankincense boswellic acids in Pathway 2 Pharo. It uses a different scaffold. It looks like it's a less amount, than what you're getting in pathway to non ferro but actually it's the same amount of the active ingredients. It's just a different scaffold. Um, and it contains no cysteine. So Jane's protocol, <coughs> or part of Jane's protocol, is something called ferroptosis. And mm -hmm. Joe, you've looked at this. And uh, we, there are certain circumstances where your functional doctor or your uh, naturopath or you yourself decide to eliminate all cysteine out of your diet and pathway to ferro was designed specifically to take cysteine out of the equation and just to re-emphasize you know they're asking again about doctors that you might work with that are integrative functional doctors please go to mycancerstory.rocks uh, later after the broadcast today it may be a little bit but we're going to post some links where you can locate doctors in your area um, uh, we have another caller you ready Very go good. for it 
Yeah. <coughs> now, we have Andrea on the phone. Hello, Andrea. Andrea, are you there? Hello. Can't, I can't hear you very well, dear. Yep. We're, you're live, Andrea. What, what's your question? Oh, I've got bunches. The more I wait on hold and the more grateful I am to be with you guys, the more things pop in my head. I wanted to address Dr. Wyndham. Um, what kind of nutritional program do you suggest because you and I both know we can change someone's religion before we change their diet. <laughs> oh, my what, gosh. What a great what comment. A great comment. Yeah. So true. Yep. I love that comment. I think I'm going to so use what, it. What do you future. suggest, doctor? <laughs> Are yes. we going vegan? So, Are we going carnivore? What are we doing? <laughs> yeah, I don't ask people to go vegan unless they want to go vegan. Um, that's, as as you say, that that's a hard sell. Um what I often recommend is what I call a, a combined microbiome slash ketogenic type of diet. So a microbiome is foods that support the healthy bacteria in the gut. And that's a big player in cancer is changes in the microbiome. And then a ketogenic diet, most people know, is mostly protein, fats, and vegetables. Um, you can look both of those up online, but the, the type of diet that I recommend is typically a combination of those two. Um, when people are open to doing a vegan type of diet, we'll do like a Pritikin type diet, and there are Pritikin nutritionists that you can counsel with online, um, but that is more vegan, and I only do that in people who are already interested in it. De Deanna, I'm going to interrupt well, real quick here before we've got Keith too. Can one? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, and this is for both. This is for Keith and Deanna. You know, it's all over the map when people do ketogenic. You get online. Some people recommend X amount of grams of protein. Some re recommend X amount of grams of carbohydrates or sugars. What do you guys recommend when you're dealing with individuals that are struggling with active cancer, in terms of that amount? Because it it's all over the map online. Well, and so I try to adjust that for a body size. Uh, I have a, a recommendation, I, I call it a palm rule, and so typically we're going to get, if they're going to have an animal protein, they're going to have a palm of animal protein at that meal, that's the size, thickness of the palm of their hand, and, and, and three palms of, if it's animal protein, of that. If we're going to go with uh, uh, veg vegetarian, vegan type proteins, uh, we have to modify that, so it typically it's going to be more like two palms of beans, which I strongly recommend. And um, and so I definitely encourage leaning toward more uh, vegetables and fruit and legumes, and not as much protein or animal protein. Uh, although, when like uh, Dr. Wyndham, I will try to help a person to adapt to what they have been doing and what they want to do rather than trying to convert somebody. That's like converting religions. Yeah. Yeah. With, with me, you can take away anything but bacon. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you see my post about bacon? <laughs> we'll give you the hybrid carnivore award today, uh, uh, Joe. Um, I would also like to add that I do tell people that it's very important the type of food that they're eating. So eat food that's just food. No hormones, antibiotics, chemicals, um, uh, additives, preservatives. So you, you don't want to get junk in. You want to get food in. So the quality of your food matters. So I'd, I'd like to address later this whole concept that has been reemerging, which is the metabolic nature of cancer. Um, maybe we could, uh, there was a book that I'd, I would recommend everybody read if they have the opportunity to. And I know, Joe, I don't know if you've read this book. It's called um, Tripping. Tripping Over the Truth by Christofferson. Have you read that? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's an amazing, it, it absolutely turned my world upside down about cancer. Uh, Dr. Wyndham actually recommended it to me. It goes through the history of cancer and something called the uh, Dr. Warburg. Mm -hmm. And, um, and his whole, effect, yeah. yeah, the Warburg effect. Um, maybe um, Keith and um, Deanna, do you mind addressing uh, this whole theory about the the origins of cancer, its metabolic nature, and what does that really? How does that affect your practice? Okay, I'll go ahead. <laughs> so we both want to talk to you about it. So it's you know, it's not easy. We can't say that. Sugar feeds cancer, 
you know, because cancer cells can actually adapt to different types of energy. And so, but, you know, we, I view that we have to change the internal environment, you know, that allowed cancer to develop. So, you know, no matter what we're doing for that treatment, what, you know, we have to change that internal environment. And, and number one is what we're eating in our lifestyle. We have to change those, those nutrients and cancer does have a tendency to thrive in a, uh, in a very simply put, you know, in a higher glucose sugar environment uh, <coughs> along with inflammation um, that can also be caused by being overweight. Uh, body fat does make inflammatory chemicals and, um, uh, and low oxygen, which means that we're supposed to be exercising more. We have to make sure we're eating our foods that have plant nitrates in them. And, um, and even the acidic, you know, uh, issue that people will talk about, you know, we have to uh, eat the right type of foods, but we have to digest things right. So uh, what I find with most of my clients, and they're just not digesting their food right, they're needing more support with uh, essentially actually, you know, hydrochloric acid to help digest the food that actually helps get rid of the acids. So it's not, you know, just one thing. There's many different things that have to be addressed, you know, and changed for change that internal environment. So I, I just uh, posted, uh, Keith, your your contact information with uh, your website, Prevail Over Cancer, if people want to get with Keith mm -hmm. about kind of diet and, uh, and nutrition. Um, you're a great consult. Um, can you only talk to people that are in Oklahoma, Keith, or can you talk to people outside of the state? Um, I have clients all over the world. Okay, great. Good to know. Thank you. Awesome. Um, we have a caller. In that, oh, go ahead, oh, Deanna. Yeah, please. I was just saying in that book, Tripping Over the Truth, they did talk about the research into a specific ketogenic diet and how that helped to change the uh, tumor microenvironment and to have positive impacts on cancer. So it can predispose the cancer to actually um, dying by stressing it out, right. essentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Very nice. Right. Um, we have a caller. So, uh, I think we have a caller. Mark, are you still on the line? Hello, Mark. Mark, are you there? Oh, Hello, he's probably Mark. calling back. Reach right. back in. Joe, real quickly, this person is confused about the amounts of FenBen from the different packets that are available um, with Panicure C. So they're wanting to know, you're the 222 milligram day guy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so... Is a four gram packet that says 888 mean that it's actually got four times the amount of yes of, the, of what your daily recommendation? Okay, y yeah. So good. the one gram is it's it's 222 milligrams per gram of powder, and so four grams is 888, and it is the cheapest way to buy it. So a lot of people that are either going to do one mill uh, one gram, they buy the four gram packet and divide it in fourths, and there you go. Yeah, and Andrea, just so uh, if you joined us late, you can rewatch the broadcast, but Joe does recommend the 222 milligram a day amount. They were confused about the whole idea of 50 milligrams per kilogram of yeah, body weight so versus the 222. Yeah, the 50, the 50, over, uh, uh, 50 milligrams per kilogram is for killing parasites, it's not for killing cancer. Very good. That's important. So I guess we're still we're having some um, phone uh, trouble. Yeah. So if you have, uh, just uh, ask the operator to transfer the question across to us, and we can ask the question directly. Well, there's, and, and I know we've we've already covered this today, but Joe, this you responded to someone back in April of 2020. Um, they are cancer free now, but their question is, have there been changes to your protocol since then? We know some yeah, of those. All of those changes have happened since then. I right. Think, yeah. Right. Okay. okay, and you can find what yeah, the, Joe recommends at the mycancerstory.rocks. Go to the, go to the blog, and there's a protocol tab at the top. Very good. We have a Very question good. from uh, Patty. Her husband has small cell cancer, mets to the liver and brain. A question also to Deanna. She's trying to convert the Safeguard 100 milligrams liquid into 222 milligram capsule. His weight is 165 pound. Should he take a break from the treatment? Does would could he get immune to it? Um, do you no, think he, there's any possibility of he, any changes there? I don't there? think so. He should take two and a half milliliters, which is, you know, what, a half a teaspoon? It's a tiny amount. Yeah, uh, it's a, that doesn't taste bad. No. Yeah, I took it for, for months, and it was fine. Um, 
Josh, do you have any more questions there? We absolutely do. Um, so someone writes, they've been diagnosed with small tumors on their adrenal gland and their liver, and they're looking for what is the best natural approach. And then do you take a break when that's going on from daily 222 milligram dosage? I wouldn't take a break unless you're causing problems to the liver. And if you're having your blood test done regularly, you'll know. Yeah. And it, it seems to be transitory. We have a call. Go ahead, Rick. Pass, patch them through. I believe we have Jermaine on the phone. Hello, Jermaine. Are you there? Hello? Hello? Yeah, hi, Jermaine. You're on. What? Uh, introduce yourself and what's your question? Hi, my name is Jermaine, and I am calling um, for us to say thank you. And um, I am on, uh, I have a triple positive breast cancer with meth to the liver. Um, I am on a 21 day, I've been on Joe's protocol for uh, two and a half months, and my next uh, scan is not until July. I am on uh, pathways one through three, but I'm very confused on the NHER2 that I receive every 21 days. I think it's time release on when, because it's an antibody and a chemo drug. My side effects don't kick in until 10 days after, so I really am not sure on when I should be taking pathway number two. Okay, and what was the, um, the chemo pill that you're taking again? What's it called? And her too. E N H E H U R T U. H E R T U. And how often do you take it? Every twenty one days. Okay. Doc, do you, are you familiar with uh, with this or Keith? I'm sorry. I'm I'm asking um, Doctor Wyndham whether uh, whether you have any comments on oh. this. Okay. No, the the ten days after, I'm not familiar with that. I'm sorry. Well, so she's taking a, an NHER2 pill? It looks like it's a, a blocking... It's a, an infusion I get. Um, it's oh, an infusion. infusion. I get with yeah. it. Every 21 days. Yeah, it's a 30-minute infusion. But uh, my side effects don't kick in until 10 days in. Interesting. That's a good question. Probably, uh, uh, probably stay away from Pathway 2. Uh, but at um, Ultra Brock. Yeah. At Ultra Brock? Yeah, Ultra Brock for breast cancer. That's the broccoli extract. That um, has the broccoli so extract. Yeah. Yeah, especially if it's uh, if it's peaking ten days later, then there would be a question. So the whole time that you're on it, I'd probably drop the pathway too, but add the Ultra Brock. Jermaine, where are you located in the states? I'm in Long Island, New York. Okay, there are a lot of uh, resources there that um, you might be able to get with to get some real solid medical advice and other things that you can be doing beyond just the pathways and, um, and finbendazole. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I think how would Keith I go back finding that? help you with supplements. Yep. You can New reach York, out to Keith. Keith. Mr. Bishop. What? I'm sorry. What's the question? Can, can you help uh, Jermaine with her, with her questions about supplementation? If she called? Yes, definitely. And it's, that's one thing that I do is I look at each drug just to make sure, you know, there's new research coming out every day on these things, supplements and prescriptions. So uh, I would you know, personalize that and I can help with that type of information, yes. Okay. Uh, Keith, one more time, what's your phone number if people want, I can get put it up here on the screen. I yes. It's right there if yeah, people want to reach out to you. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Um, next question. Let's yes. Let's keep going. Thank so, you, Jermaine. Um, this individual says, where did I go wrong, Joe? I uh, used uh, the Panicure three days on and four off for a couple of years, and my cancer grew a lot. And I know there's not a lot of information yeah, there. Yeah, I don't know. And, and You know, uh, one of the unfortunate things in this whole journey is we don't know the denominator. <laughs> we, I know that there's, we're now up over 1,100 success cases. Um, Maybe 10% of those are anecdotal, but probably 90% of them are real. Um, and uh, I would just advise to go on seven days a week uh, instead of three uh, and see if there's a change. And uh, go ahead, Doc. Yep. You know, 
I would also add, just make sure that you're doing the other things, like talk to a nutritionist like Keith Bishop, start on the pathways, make sure that you're addressing diet, um, work with a practitioner. There might be other things going on that you're just not addressing as far as the tumor microenvironment and what's causing your body to develop cancer. Thanks, Deanna. Very good. Karen writes, Joe, that uh, she's been on the protocol uh, since the end of January 23. Feels great most days. However, her scans are showing some growth of METs in the liver and elevated liver uh, blood work and chromogranin, which is uh, her chromogranin A, her tumor marker. Uh, she's scheduled for a CERT procedure in mid-August. She's just wondering, could the protocol actually be stimulating or causing tumor growth? Boy, I haven't. It's tough. I, it's a tough one. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think so, but uh, I, I doubt, I mean, this is just my opinion, I doubt the fenbendazole is making it worse. Uh, it, uh, it just doesn't, it, it, it defies logic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Very good. I still think there's, there's other internal things, you know, the, the things that they're doing every day there's some other factors that they need to evaluate and do also. We can't just rely on a pill or a packet. That's not always the answer. It's a combination. Yeah, there's all there's so many amazing novel treatments that are coming out uh, that could be synergi synergizing with everything the oncologist is doing. Um, the the diet that uh, Dr. Wyndham talked about and Keith Bishop. Um, there's hyperbaric oxygen, which is a really interesting addition to the equation for people that are, are doing a metabolic approach to cancer. And there are so many other products that can be utilized in conjunction with Joe's protocol that uh, any of these functional doctors can have. And I think we have this caller coming in. Who do we have, Rick? Have we answer. have Scott on the line. Hello, Scott. I want to answer that. Ask your question. Go ahead. What? Hey, Scott, you're on. What, what's your question? Hello? Hello, Scott. Hello, Scott. Hello, Are you there? From... Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I have stage 4 metastatic cancer caused with pancreatic cancer. I was uh, diagnosed with pancreatic cancer um, in January of 2019. And um, I did a prettier six months, over six months of treatment in 2019, uh, chemotherapy treatment. 2020, I started on the fenbendazole when I found out about it, and I took it for over a year and decided at that point I really didn't need to take any more because I felt so good and everything was going well. Never dreamed that this would ever happen. Um, January of this year, they found that I had metastatic cancer. Um, it was very small. My antigen, cancer antigen number was 150. And um, it is now 1,459. I am taking fenbendazole two doses a day seven days a week. Um, they did give me chemotherapy in, I think it was March or April, I guess it was April, um, but the Rochester Clinic laid out the way they wanted it done, and the La Crosse Clinic decided that they didn't need to follow that agenda, and they gave me way more in a shorter period of time, I thought for sure I was going to die, so I quit. And um, the, the, the tumor, I can feel it. It is floating in my abdomen. It is, uh, according to Rochester, it was not attached to any of my organs. Wow. Um, my question is, can I take, have you, do you know of anyone that's ever taken up to four doses a day or maybe three doses a day, whatever, to Scott, uh, try to kill this. Scott, let me tell you, uh, you need to stay on it, and here's why. In the seven 
fourth stage pancreatic pancreatic success cases I know about, and I think there's probably more. Yeah, a whole bunch. Um, <clears throat> in four of the seven, uh, they were able to keep the cancer at bay and live a normal lifestyle far beyond what their life expectancy was. And they're still doing that today, now five years later. But in three of the cases, after eight, in, in one case 18 months, one case 20 months, one case 24 months, they, w they became NED, which is unheard of for fourth stage pancreatic cancer. So uh, we have at least some cases where we know if you stayed on it long term, as much as two to three years and four years, uh, there's benefit. And I, again, we had this question earlier. If you want to go to four doses, I, th I think it's probably safe. Um, uh, we, again, you, you may not have been on the, on the call earlier, but uh, Johns Hopkins has done a clinical a, a toxicity trial that says it's safe at 500 milligrams a day long term. Great. Hey, thank you so much for the call. I hope that was helpful to you, uh, Joe. Well, did you did you understand that it, I now have metastatic cancer from the pancreatic cancer? Well, everybody else I just des described did as well. Yeah, well, they stuck okay. to it. All right. Yeah, I, I have a question. I, I have a question. Are you taking the Pathway products too, or are you not taking those? I have not taken anything other than um, the curcumin. Um, I guess um, my sister has been after me to start taking some of the other stuff, and well, I guess if you, I can do that. If you're taking over-the-counter curcumin, you're not getting anything out of it. Oh. Yeah, we, we, okay. we um, just, to, I want to uh, underscore a, a, something that we do for people that are having, that are having a hard time affording uh, any of the pathway products. If anybody is on social security or disability, we have significant savings that are available to people that um, uh, are in dire need of, of products. We understand specifically the fiscal difficulties that uh, treating cancer can put some a lot of stress on people. In certain circumstances, we've actually almost given away the product because they've had no money to pay for it. So we don't want, it, it is our policy, we at Ultra Botanica, that if somebody is having a hard time affording the products, we will not turn you away. We have um, discounts and uh, we have people that have donated to us that allow us to provide the products at, severe, at significantly discounted prices. So I just wanted to say, if anybody wants to take the products, please don't let the financial aspect of it prevent you from reaching out to us. We can help you. Okay. Very I good. Thank, Thank you, you so much for the call. Hey, Joe, active cancers, 222 milligrams, seven days a week. At what point does an individual go onto a maintenance dosage like you? I would say one year after remission. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Very good. Important. One year. One year. Uh, okay. Would you use a FinBen if it had an expired date on it? I get asked that question all the time. <laughs> I bet you and, have. And, you know, I personally have taken a, a products with the expire, expiration date. Um, maybe a cautionary tale would say don't because there's some reason they use that, that expiration date. You might as well. I mean, it's so inexpensive to get yeah. a fresh supply of fenbendazole. Right. Just go out and get the fresh one if, if necessary. I okay, we've got that based oh. on research. Sure, please, Deanna. Um, there was research done at a, a hospital that had been abandoned for 40 years, and they left all the medications in the hospital when they left. Researchers went in there 40 years later and tested the efficacy of the medications, and huh. um, barring uh, liquid medications, the pills were all still viable. So that was 40 years after expiration.
Am I still live with you guys? I don't know. Can you hear me, Deanna? I'm going to wait because I'm not sure what's happening here. I can. Yeah, can you not hear me? Talk about technical difficulties. Our computer rebooted in the midst of the broadcast here. <laughs> so um, we're going to wrap it up for now. I think this has been, we've covered a whole bunch of topics. Deanna and Keith, do you have any uh, any uh, final things you want to say? And Joe, you want to say something there? Yeah, I just got a text from one of my Facebook moderators. Yes. Uh, and he wanted to clarify that uh, Merck does have a product in Australia called Cooper's Panicure 100, which is available in Australia. I didn't know that. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Dr. Wyndham, uh, any any uh, closing ideas here or thoughts? I would say in closing that I would definitely recommend, I, I love finbendazole. I like to use it with the pathways um, and not with other supplements. I'm not associated with Ultra Botanica. I just really like those products and think they work really well. Um, especially as compared to others. And I do believe that it's super important to address other aspects of cancer therapy, including diet and lifestyle and sleep. And so working with an integrative or functional medicine practitioner or functional nutritionist is super important. Uh, Deanna, for people that wanted to reach out to you, what's a good phone number for them to use? Okay, so the best way to reach us is on our website, Whole Human life.com w-h-o-l-e human life.com and our phone number i have to look it up because it just changed our phone number is 888-988-1520 888-988-1520 okay so there we go that's uh, deanna's uh, contact information and uh, Keith, we have your contact information here. Any, th any thoughts for closing, Keith? Yes, I, I think the more things we can do, the better the results. And not just rely on one pill, one particular treatment, but it's a combination. So even when they do chemotherapy and or radiation, they're not just doing typically one drug. They're trying to hit it from different angles, different pathways, different internal activities of the cancer cells so we need to do the same and that includes you know includes including food changes and food and lifestyle which is kind of like that's my specialty but most of my clients i always see several uh, foods that are a, a significant issue that they're not making changes on well thank you everybody we really appreciate everybody that participated and everybody that contributed their their questions to the uh, q a session this will be posted on Joe's um, uh, Facebook group and also on uh, uh, mycancerstory.rocks. The questions that were not answered today, we will do our best to address those um, uh, individually after the broadcast here. We really do appreciate everybody that uh, reached out to us today. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.